Um, but welcome to the online data science and software engineer um, final project showcase. We are joined here by three of our recent graduates who are going to present their final projects. And you can see um, what you will be working towards um, in the program and see the amazingness of what they built. We're really lucky to have these three joining us today. There are some three amazing, amazing projects. So I'm really excited for you all to see them. Um, a couple of just logistical things. Um, each presenter is going to present their project. While they are presenting, any questions that you have, you can either put into the chat box or into the question and answer box. Um, you should see those down at the bottom of your screen. And so feel free to just flood that with questions for our panelists. And I will make sure that we get to all of them as long as um, we don't run out of time at the end. But you can continue to ask panelists questions um, and we will ask them. Um, I will make sure that they are asked to those panelists um, regardless of if they are continuing to go. So like if we're at the third panelist, but you have a, a you remember a question that you wanted to ask the first panelist, just feel free to put that in the box and direct who it's to. And I will make sure that that's all, that's all um, asked at the, by the end. Um, so, um, all right. Cool, so we are going to begin. Um, please give a big virtual round of applause to our recent graduates for doing such an amazing job. So excited for them. Um, and we are going to start with um, Raquel, who is a software engineer. So take it away, Raquel. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Raquel. I am a software engineer, full stack. I graduated in December and I wrote an app called Plantiverse. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see it? Thumbs up, Gretchen? Yes. Okay, cool. So this is my app. Um, it's a social networking site for plant lovers, so it gives users an opportunity to interact with other plant owners or lover lovers, and um, it helps them solve any plant related issues or answer any questions that they have with this chat form that I have. Um, there's a message form, there is a plant data that I scraped that from a database and let me show you the demo all right so this is what you hit when you first come into the page um you have to log in so let's use the dummy dummy data okay so it redirects you to the plant uh the users page um, from here, you can see all plants. And this is just a bunch of different plant data that I scraped from a website that I'll show you guys later. Um, you could add plants to a collection and it shows up in your own little sidebar. And then you could click that plant and it gives you a little about me. You could also remove it. So you could remove it from your collection. And then when you go to the message boards, you can um, ask for advice. Somebody already posted a dying plant and you can comment on it. It looks bad. Cool, so it pops up on the bottom. Um, so that is mostly what the app does. Let me go back to the slideshow. Uh, some of the technologies I've used, uh, I used React for my front end and the React router for routing to different pages. I used the Redux Thunk store to store different states. Uh, Rails as my back end. And I used Material UI. I used the Postgres SQL database. I used the Active Model Serializer. Um, I used a gem called Pagey to paginate my backend. And some other um, technologies I used, I used Bcrypt for storing and hashing passwords. 
Nokogiri for um, scraping my database, uh, Lorem Ipsum generator, and JWT web tokens to store user information when they log in or log out. Um, some of the challenges that I faced was uh, scraping data from uh, Tropicopia. It's a very old website and their labeling is horrible. So I had to uh, pretty much jerry rig um, all my scraping and use a lot of conditionals. And it was just a very, it was very dense to write the code on my back end. Um, and then another challenge is getting my front end to be responsive with my back end when I use Material UI's pagination template, just like getting those two technologies to talk, getting it to read um, my routing and some styling with Material UI. Uh, it wasn't very mobile friendly. <laughs> so I had to like do a lot of custom editing with that as well. Um, some things I could add on to my app is utilizing more create, reading, updating, destroy. Um, just having users uh, have more access to deleting posts that they put or making uh, deleting a plant from your collection a little bit more user friendly. Um, I can add a search bar in the plant pages just to better look up plants instead of going through all the pages. Uh, I also thought about adding Google Maps to pinpoint where in the world each user's plans, like the origin is, but that, that's later on, and mobile responsiveness. And that was my app. That was a quick little to-do. Um, here are my, here's my contact info, my LinkedIn, my blog, my repo, my email, and uh, some links to where you can access the app. Awesome, Raquel. Thank you. Very good. Awesome. 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 Love this. It's also something I could have used um, when my gardenia plant died. So, <laughs> so um, please, please, everyone in um, the webinar, feel free to take a screenshot of all this contact information or write down um, the medium in which you would like to reach out to Raquel for, you know, any opportunities or or uh, networking or anything like that. Um, I have a couple of questions. Would you be able to explain, Raquel, what scraping means in like beginner terms? <laughs> oh, and explain like I'm five, what scraping is? <laughs> yeah. So scraping is when you go onto a website and you want to get specific data from that website and um, you use, Oh, how, how can I simplify this? You use certain selectors to find um, parts of where the code that you want to scrape in. So it's just getting data from any page and putting it onto your site. Awesome, thank you. Um, Altef wants to know if you made or are thinking of making like an app for this website. Like a mobile friendly app? I guess, yeah. Uh, not in the immediate future, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's something you can work on together. Um, Andrew would like to know what made you decide to scrape the data instead of fetching plant data from an API? Great question. Yes, that would have made my life so much easier. Um, I I could not find any houseplant APIs. Um, there were some websites that I found, but it was just like either not the plants that I was looking for. It was like farm data, mm. but there were no plant specific um, APIs, house plant specific. Awesome. Well, thank you, Raquel, very much. Amazing job. Loved that. And thank you everyone for answering questions. Again, if you think of anything moving forward, um, please feel free to put, them in the, put it in the chat or in the question and answer, and I will make sure that we get to it by the end. But great job. Thank you, Raquel. <laughs> um, okay. So next we are moving on to Eric. Eric is one of our recent data science um, graduates. So please welcome Eric. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. 
And let me just get my screen share going. Okay. So for my final project, I worked on modeling state legislative elections. So uh, for a little context, before I enrolled in Flight Iron, I actually worked on a number of political campaigns and the last couple were, uh, were assembly races in New York State. Um, and something I found is that uh, local races get uh, an undeserved, uh, disproportionately low amount of attention, especially from data journalists and publicly available data analysis. Um, part of that is because there's not a lot of polling, but also there's just not a lot of public interest, which is a shame because uh, state elections really have the quickest and biggest impact on, uh, on people's lives. So I, uh, so I, I sought out to, uh, to try to address this problem. Uh, so I sought to create an effective model for predicting state legislative races in all 50 states in order to uh, basically aid uh, stakeholders, whether they be political parties or interest groups, uh, in allocating resources where they might be most impactful. Uh, my goal was to classify every race as either a safe Republican seat, a safe Democratic seat, or a toss-up, which I defined as a race in which I thought the winner uh, was going to be within 10 percentage points of the runner-up. And next. So my methodology. Uh, for data, I gathered uh, census demographic data, specifically from uh, the American Community Survey. Uh, I collected things such as uh, income information, marital status, age, race, education, uh, combined that with uh, electoral results, and also added in, uh, I basically downloaded shape files for every district uh, to try to, uh, to try to derive the, the, how big the districts were and therefore derive the population density. So I could tell if it was, you know, an urban district, a suburban district, that sort of thing. The technologies I used include uh, Google Colab, uh, GeoPandas, Scikit-Learn for, uh, for modeling mostly, uh, pandas and NumPy for, uh, for manipulating the data, as well as CatBoost, uh, LightGBM, and XGBoost for further modeling. And as far as my results, um, for my national model, uh, what I found uh, was that the models that performed the best uh, were CatBoost classifier and random forest classification. Uh, random forest was able to give me about an 85% accuracy uh, while accurately classifying about 47% of, uh, of actual toss-up races. Another approach I took was uh, modeling every state separately. So I basically ran every state's uh, data through, uh, through my models uh, to see how they came out. And that averaged at about an 81% accuracy. Um, and and the, their performance really ranged uh, from you know, the high 90s to I would say the low 50s. Um, and some interesting sort of uh, things I noticed about which states are performing better um, uh, was that states that were performing better tended to be bigger states and more, I would say, politically uh, consistent, politically you know, e easy to understand, such as New York, California, Texas, um, whereas the states that performed the worst uh, were uh, a bit ideolog ideologically all over the place and with smaller populations like Rhode Island and West Virginia. Uh, here you can see the most influential factors that, uh, that uh, would determine what category a race uh, fell into. Uh, by far, the uh, biggest uh, impact was uh, the, whether or not the previous winner was a Democrat. Um, some of the other important factors uh, was the history of the district, uh, the year, what state it was in, and uh, whether there was a Democratic incumbent. Uh, so some of my takeaways from that uh, were that uh, seat history, by far the most important factor. Uh, something I thought was interesting is that Democratic incumbency was a stronger indicator of Democratic success than Republican incumbency was for Republican success. Uh, another takeaway was that 
uh, the prevalence of low income, uh, low income people in a district was a stronger indicator than the, pre uh, the presence of high income people. My conclusion is that modeling uh, electoral outcomes in uh, local races where there isn't a lot of polling uh, requires a great deal of context. Uh, it, it, you need to know about the district, you need to know who's there, and, and those are the sort of things uh, that, that give you a sort of edge in that case. If I were to continue uh, this project, uh, things I would try to do uh, include uh, further manipulation of the data, um, collecting district information from uh, commercial sources to get um, uh, sort of deeper, more, more personal uh, information, such as like shopping habits and things like that, the sort of thing that Facebook collects. I would extend my time period now, uh, analyze. And uh, I would also seek to uh, research the impact that uh, the presence of high profile races on a ballot can have on, uh, on low information races on the same ballot, see how they affect turnout and how that uh, can affect uh, the predictability of, uh, of these races. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. And uh, this is my contact info. Feel free to reach out if you have any, uh, if you want to reach out. Awesome, Eric. Thank you so much. This was, yeah, I, Eva, I agree. Fascinating. This was super, super fascinating. Um, uh, Eric, can you just clarify for this? Um, did, was this a group project or a partner project, or did you work on this on your own? Was one of the no, questions. this is just me. <laughs> and I, I know that's also the case for Christine and Raquel is that it was solo, a solo project also. Um, and then I have two other questions. Joshua wants to know, can you help us understand what shape files are? Oh, sure. So uh, shapefiles are basically, um, uh, from my understanding, basically a collection of, of uh, polygons, shapes, um, with, with certain coordinates um, that uh, aim to sort of represent a geographic, uh, a geographic space. And when, uh, uh, when properly analyzed, can give you the, uh, uh, the basically the area of the space that you're looking at. So in my case, I took the shape files of the districts uh, to find the square kilometers and then use that to find the population density. Fascinating, awesome. <laughs> um, also another question is technologies you use for your project. Did you learn them all at Flatiron or did you have prior knowledge? Or I'm gonna add on to that question or did you learn any of these on your own? Like um, uh, Google Colab, I came to on my own. Um, basically, it's uh, a simple way of, uh, of creating a, an environment uh, to, to do this work in um, without having to maintain everything on your computer. So if you have sort of a computer that's not as strong, uh, you can use Google's uh, Google stuff. It's a, I think it's like $10 a month, so it's not terrible. Um, and everything else, um, uh, except for maybe Cat Boost and uh, Light GBM uh, are taught at uh, at Flatiron, and the others, you know, are very simple to, uh, to figure out once you once you're given you know the knowledge that Flatiron gives. Awesome. Can you just go back to your last page really fast? Oh yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Eva has a question. Cat Boost question mark. I don't know. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> um. I. Uh, I, I don't think it has anything to do with cats. I, th I think cat, my uh, uh, guess has a, is an abbreviation for a category. Um, it, it's uh, one um, sort of popular uh, modeling, uh, modeling library uh, to, to figure out, you know, uh, category classification. Thank you. Um, I, I will be honest, as you know, I work at Flatiron. I am not a technical person. I do not teach any of this information. So a lot of the time when I host these and, and the graduates are talking through things like this, I just feel more and more stupid. So thank you. <laughs> I am feeling that right now. Um, and Jonathan wants to know for your vis visualizations, like why didn't you use Metplotlib? Metplotlib? I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, no particular reason. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no particular reason. I was just, um, what was, uh, I just used what was convenient. Awesome. 
Well, thank you so much, everyone. Please make sure that you write down this information, take a screenshot, reach out to Eric. Um, this is fa some fascinating stuff. Um, and I would love to see, oh, sorry, we have two more in here. So will you turn on live? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I actually, let me figure that out because in my settings, I have that turned on. So if it's not doing it, I'm not sure why. So give me one second. I just want to see if I can figure that out. Sorry about that. Here, here, here. Okay. That it's it's enabled, so that should have worked. If it doesn't, please let me know. Okay, great, it's working. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, and then, um, okay, yes, Joshua, I am gonna get that. I'm gonna hit that question at the end and do it. I'm gonna. Uh, feel that towards all of our participants. Um, so I will definitely hit that at the end, but thank you. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Again, give him a well, a warm, warm round of applause. That was awesome. Okay. All right. So now we are going to move on to our last par um, participant. We are um, joined by Christine, who is another software engineer graduate. So thank you, Christine, for joining. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm having a little bit of internet issues. So if I'm going in and out, just let me know. Um, but as Gretchen said, Oh, it says somebody else is sharing, so I can't share yet. Um, yeah, but yeah, there you go. If you could. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm Christine Contreras. I'm a recent graduate of Flatiron. And let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Everything's going a little slow here. Okay, great. So here's my slides. So uh, I'm a recent pool stack uh, web developer, but previous to Flatiron, I actually worked in digital marketing and e-commerce, and I worked hand in hand with the uh, uh, e-com department that handles the website. And I thought it was so intricate and so much detail goes into e-com sites. So um, I was really excited about this capstone project because I got to make an e-com store. So. Uh, I ended up making an e-com store called Free Spirit Designs. Yeah, here we go. So it's a boutique online jewelry store, and it keeps in mind both the user and the owner. So if you're the business owner, you can log in, you can create categories, products, SKUs, you can view orders or update them. And then if you're a user, you can browse those categories and products and make a purchase, which is the ultimate goal of an e-com store. So I'm going to um, walk you through a demo of the site really quick. So if you're logged in as the admin, this is the um, dashboard you'll see. And I have all my products here. You can view all categories for the site. Um, sorry, computer tools. Okay, categories. I can add, edit, delete a category. I can view all orders for this site. So um, I can see all the orders that have been placed. Are you guys able to see my- Yeah, we're seeing it. We're just seeing the, the it's going slow. 
It's going slow on my screen too, so one moment. My internet is going really slow, so bear with me. I think y'all are seeing a late, like a delayed response. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and add a category to this. Um, I'm going to add a product to the site just so you can see what that kind of looks like if you're the admin of the site. So if I click add a product, I should see a modal pop up right here. And it's going to I will also just attest that we, Christine and I did a run through of this. She did it for me and it was, it's not her app that's going this slow. It is definitely the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, you guys are in and out for me too. So um, I think. So let me go ahead and I'm having internet issues, Gretchen. Is it okay if I log in and log out? Yes, of course. And see if that helps anything. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Scott agreed. We can do so much with the internet. Like we can do so much with technology, right? They're building these gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous applications and then it's just all it takes is the internet to just be real fickle. <laughs> okay, I'll be I'll be right back. Take your time. Yeah, exactly. Joshua is always at the at the worst time. I will I will share that I once had when I was in an interview, I was like having, you know, <laughs> internet problems and I was just like going in and out and I was like this is the worst for an interview <laughs> it's like really now um um yes I will I will post it um for sure the recording and it will be on the um Flatiron YouTube channel as well so you can you can check it out at any point but thank you for coming um Sorry for this, folks, but thank you for your patience. Appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, while we're waiting, um, Eric and Raquel, do you want to answer Joshua's question about what pacing you are you chose to finish the program in? Okay. Hopefully. That we'll get to that. Later. Okay, go ahead, Christine. Sorry. <laughs> when I talk to IT, they always say turn it on and off first thing. So yeah, and kick it maybe. You know, I mean. <laughs> okay, let me see if we can start. And as soon as I stopped sharing, it started working. So I'm not sure if it's like just a lot of bandwidth. Um, okay. All right. Well, the product was created. <laughs> in the back end. So I'm going to go ahead and create a SKU for it as well. Oh, look, now everything's working out. OK, so um, I'll make it $100. And I'll say we have 10 in stock. And you can change the size here, but I'm going to keep it as one size in gold. And then it, you can add an image to this SKU. So I'm going to go ahead and upload an image right now. And I have a test image that we can use. So I'm going to create that one and then create skew in. I think it froze. Okay, there we go. So I created skew and the last thing that you have to do to create a product on this site is to slot it to some categories. So since we added some rings, I'm gonna go ahead and do view all and rings and then I'm going to save it. Great, looks good. 
Let me make sure it saved it. It's going slow again. Okay, so it's right here. Ah. It thinks I'm offline, so. Uh -oh. uh, Christine, while you wait for the page to load, how do you feel about answering some questions? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, the design of the site is really nice. Do you write the CSS yourself or use something like Bootstrap? Uh, so I did a little of both. Um, actually, I used the same uh, library as Raquel did. I used Material UI um, and then it customized it from there. So um, I extensively like worked out wireframes for this to have an aesthetic that I wanted and it, I dedicated about a week to that. So um, pro like going through and coding it was a lot easier because I knew what I wanted to look like ahead of time. Um, but yeah, I re highly recommend Material UI if you're new to design and you're, uh, just make it look good without all the, as much effort, you're not used to front-end development. Great. Um, okay, what font is being used for your headers and what did you use to design your logo? Oh yeah, so uh, I used Photoshop for my logo and I would have to look up the font, but I purchased it and then I uploaded it to my React front end. And um, that's how I'm able to display it. So um, it looks like things are starting to load um, again. It's just very slow. Um, okay. Um, will you have batch update function available rather than updating SKU one by one eventually? Um, that's a good question. I, and, and yeah, I do think that's a good idea. A batch uh, was something that I um, wanted to implement afterwards as like an add-on. So like you can, uh, select more than one product or one more than one SKU and activate them, deactivate them, or change something about them. So um, that is a good idea and something I thought about. Okay, good. Um, I can kind of walk through some of it if you're a user, um, see if it goes through. Okay, so this is what a category page looks like. And um, I'm in the view all right now. And if I scroll down, I can see all my products here. Um, and I can even see the test product that I just created, which is great. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick one of the products so you can see what a, um, product page looks like. So when you click on it, um, it's loading right now. Um, again, everything's so slow. So this is what the product page looks like. You'll see all the information I put on the back end here. And then if I go ahead and add this to my cart, um, when the cart opens up right now, this is what it looks like. And you'll see I qualify for free shipping because I my product is over $100. And this is what um, the checkout looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and check out. And when you hit checkout, I made it mandatory to log in. So I'm just gonna use a dummy account. And Okay. 
Okay, so when you're logged in, you'll be, uh, it'll show that I'm logged in, but it should redirect me to Stripe if my internet is working. Um, okay, there we go. So I'm going to be um, redirected to Stripe checkout so that I could have a secure checkout for anybody coming to the site. And when you go to Stripe, you'll input in your, your information like you would any other site. Um, so, you will. So it is my internet, it's not <laughs> my site because Stripe is having a little bit of trouble as well. Um, okay. It looks like it's redirecting me because my internet's too slow for Stripe checkout. Okay, there we go. Um, let me just type in some information here. But as I'm typing, I guess this has taken a little while. So I can kind of briefly talk about the um, technologies that I used. So on the front end, I did use React and I used Recoil for my state management. And then, as I said, I used Material UI for the design of the site on the front end. And then for my back end API, I used Ruby on Rails and I integrated Stripe Checkout, as you can see. And then when I was uploading the image to um, for the SKU, it's actually, uh, I'm using AWS S3 to store all my images. So that's where those are going. And even this is going slow. And I did uh, deploy this to Heroku, but um, I thought it would slow down my internet. And so <laughs> um, it still did. So, something. <sighs> okay, so Stripe hopefully will process this and once it does, it's going to be redirected back to my site and hopefully um, the information is sent back with the slow internet speed, but if the information is sent back, I will get an order confirmation and it'll show what I just purchased, the information I just put into Stripe, etc. Um, so see if it does that for you guys. Um, I'm also, I have a demo of this, so I'm willing to send it out to you so you guys can see the full effect of it that without these internet issues. Um, but I can go ahead, since this is taking a little while, I'll just go back to my um, slides for you and talk about other difficulties I had besides this presentation. Um, <laughs> so um, I talked a little bit about the technologies that I used, but the biggest challenge I ran into was the um, image upload to my AWS S3. So um, that in itself was difficult for me because I've never done it before. But um, the real difficulty came when I tried to um, deploy my site to Heroku. Everything was working until I tried to upload an image. And then Heroku told me 
um, I was getting an error because they have a 500 megabyte max limit of upload. And um, what I was really doing is um, sending my whole image to my back end. It was storing it, then it was sending it to AWS3 bucket, and then it was sending back to the front end. And Hiroko was saying like, that was just too much. Um, so I had to refactor my front end and my back end. And, oh no, there you go. So um, as you can see, this is the flow I had. I'm not gonna get into it too much, but it's kind of what I just said. I was sending my whole image to my back end and then trying to send it to my front end. So I reconfigured it to be this direct upload flow where I was just sending the name to the back end. And then uh, uh, my API was creating a unique and secure link and sending it to my front end. And then I was able to upload the image directly to my S3 bucket from my React front end. And even if you don't understand that, you can see it's so many different, uh, it's so many less steps. So it, it didn't take as long as it did the first time. And I'm really glad I got to troubleshoot that. So uh, I'm really sorry the presentation was slow guys, but I will send it out to you. And if you guys want to stay in touch, you absolutely can. But I had a great experience in Flatiron and I hope like you have some new ideas or inspiration for all the students. Christine, thank you so much. And like, I mean, way to stay cool under like pressure. I, I would probably, I would have probably just been like, I'm done. I can't do this. Forget it. So like way to stick it out and like show this. It is a beautiful project. Please everyone. I really strongly encourage you to take a picture, a screenshot of this, reach out to Christine, let her send you the demo so you can see like an uninterrupted um, walkthrough of this. It is it is really, really beautiful. And yeah, everyone is saying it's really beautiful. You can't help a slow internet, like don't worry about it. And you did a great job. So great, great job. <laughs> um, we do have some questions for, um, really everyone. Um, I'm going to start specifically with you, Christine and Raquel, because there was a question around software engineering. Um, either, both of you do not have a computer science degree, correct? Right. I do not, no. Yeah, no. Both of them just started out. And did you have any coding experience before coming to Flatiron or was this your first experience with it? Um, I don't know about Raquel, but I have a little bit of coding, mostly some HTML and CSS on the front end. Oh, um, we just lost you for a second. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe, maybe stop the share um, and then just everyone make sure you take a screenshot of this um, stay in touch page and then I'll we put, can. Um, I'll put the, my stuff in the chat as well. Perfect, right. perfect. Yeah, so um, as I was saying, uh, I minimal, I knew some HTML and CSS because I worked in digital marketing and I had to do some A-B tests for um, But other than through Flatiron. Yeah, and Raquel, what about you? Kind of similar. I knew some CSS and HTML before going into this, but also before I started the Flatiron program, I started learning some JavaScript. Like I took a month long course um, before I enrolled. Cool. And then do either of you have any like advice for anyone just starting out in, in software engineering or anything like that? Uh, yeah, well, if you can hear me. Um... <laughs> So I think everything you learn in Flatiron is super important, but I think where the most growth came from me is whatever I learned in Flatiron, I was doing side projects with them to really better understand them. And I think that's where a lot of my growth came from. It was like, oh, I learned this in Flatiron, but what can I push a little bit more? And those are where the real questions came from. Awesome. Yeah, I agree with Christine. Side projects are definitely really important. And other advice is you have to have grit in order to go through the program. Um, just keep pushing yourself. Uh, there's, a, it's also really time extensive. So you have to go into this program with the mindset that this is going to be really hard, but I'm going to stick through it and it pays off at the end. 
Great. Um, Eric, do you have any, just, uh, this is, cause there's another question that's just, um, for all of you, but like, if you had one piece of advice for a new flat iron student, just starting their journey, what would it be? Um, yeah, just to know going in that it's going to be a major time commitment, um, no matter, you know, what pace you take it at, um, and, and self-motivation is going to be very important, you know, uh, keeping, being able to, to stick with the work, even, when it gets really challenging and when you get like really discouraged, just being able to get back into it. Great. And then could you all just share um, what pace you did? Did you do live, um, like the part-time or flex, which is like 12 weeks or 15 weeks, like what pacing were you? Uh, I personally, I, I work a 40 hour work week. So I did the uh, part-time. So I started last April and ended this January, February. Me too, part-time remote. I also did part-time remote. Great. Um, okay, and then do you, um, do you have a preference for doing either front-end or back-end development? Oh, either one of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I honestly like both. Um, I thought I would like the front end most because that's where I had some of my uh, practice in. But the back end actually was the most engaging for me because it's something I've never done before and I'm, I'm such a learner. So it was all new to me. So it was very exciting, interesting, and a lot of problem solving. I would say, I want to say both, but if I were to really choose between the two, like if you held the gun to my head, um, I would choose front end. Um, I do like the back end, but I hate working with SQL databases. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like Christine said, um, it was like, it was learning something new. And I really like that with Ruby, you can play with gems, which is um, something that you can't really do with the front end. Um, okay. And then this is for all of you, but was the actual work of like doing what you were training to do, um, something that you enjoyed more or less than you had expected to when you were, um, just entering? I don't think joy is the right word because I think it was on par because I like development a lot. It's like a passion of mine. So I always find it interesting, but I do think it was harder than I expected because it's a lot of work and the phases vary in how much work you do in them. Um, especially like the JavaScript and the Ruby ones, it's, it's just a lot in one phase. So you do have to dedicate more time. Not that I didn't think you had to, but it is more work than you probably think it is. Yeah, it was definitely a lot of work. Also, if you're working full time and you're doing the um, the uh, part time remote, it's like having two full time jobs. Like you really have to sit down and dedicate a lot of time to learn and do this. Um, like give up on your social life and. Uh, that, that's, that's what I had to do. But in the end, it was very satisfying. I felt like it really paid off. Like the website that I built, I and never in a million years before doing this program, I could have imagined to do something like that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's basically my feeling as well. Um, I, I personally enjoy, you know, problem solving and, and sort of puzzling my way through, through challenges I'm having. Um, but it, it's, uh, it can be very frustrating. But ultimately, you know, by the end of it, you find that you're able to do things that you, you know, couldn't imagine trying to do, you know, when you started, which is really satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You look at your phase one project and you <laughs> have some project, you're like, wow, I didn't know I was learning this much, but I, I really did grow a lot. So. Yeah, I think I would echo there's, there comes a time in, in the, um, within the program and it might be multiple times that, you know, students will be like, I don't know anything. I haven't learned anything. I'm like, not 
you know, I'm not progressing. And I always recommend like, go back and do the first lesson even that you did and like, see how much easier it is for you to do now than like it was that day. And like, just constantly reflecting on, yeah, like looking at your, you know, your phase one project, like in comparison to whatever project you're on now, and you'll see that you actually have been growing a lot more than you realize. Um, sometimes it's just hard to process that you are growing so much because it's moving so fast. Um, um, also just a question in here, do you all have any career opportunities lined up yet? Or do you already have positions in the field that you wanna work? What, what's your status? I'm currently working through the career process, which is awesome. The one that Flatiron gives you, it's just preparing you so much. So I'm going to I'm at the time, I'm looking soon, but yeah. I just accepted an offer last week, so <laughs> thank you. So I'm just moving along with the process there. Hopefully everything works out and yeah. Uh, I'm about, I guess, a few weeks or a month into uh, the, the job search process. Um, and I've had uh, three interviews and uh, I'm expecting a job offer pretty quick, pretty soon. Yay! <laughs> Love hearing that. Um, okay. All right. Well, I believe that that is it for our questions. Um, thank you so much um, to our graduates who came and took the time to demo their projects. Um, they really are so amazing. I hope that you all wrote down their contact information and we'll reach out to them and, um, I don't know, build a project together or, you know, something, <laughs> um, uh, work together and all, all the things. So thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for coming and asking your questions. Um, they were super thoughtful. Um, and yeah, I'm just excited to see what you all do in the field. And I know it's going to be amazing. So thank you everyone. Have a good rest of your night. Bye.